Um, before I dive in, I want to thank you all for coming out to this session. I hope the camp's been super inspiring, but also really fun. Um, this is actually my first mid-camp, um, and I am a Midwesterner, but now I'm in the Bay Area Drupal community, so it's great to meet Midwestern Drupalers. Um, so I'll try to make this fun and informative and keep our good conference vibes going into the afternoon. So without further ado, um, welcome to Beyond Herding Cats, project management in a small agency. Um, whether you yourself are a project manager in a small agency, a PM in a big agency who's ma managing a smaller team, maybe a freelancer who's project managing themselves, or a developer or designer who's trying to learn to live with a PM without hating them, um, hopefully this will be a good session for you. So who in the room is a project manager? Who in the room is a developer? Lots of you. Who in the room is a designer? Good to get a sense. Um, so this session really came out of feeling like most project management resources were geared towards people in big companies with already established processes and really clear guidelines. Um, but I'm someone who doesn't work on a large company and the companies that I work for are reasonably new and very small. And so what I was seeing in my day to day, the challenges I was dealing with were not being reflected in any of the materials that I was finding for education and resources. Um, so I decided to work on trying to create some resources out of those experiences, out of those times that we tried to implement new processes and failed, or the times that we were successful. Let's see if I can actually click through my slides. There we go. Okay, so I'm Tori Lewis. You can find me on Twitter at Tori Lewis Writes. So if you have questions or tips that I did not cover, um, please find me on there. I currently divide my time between two different small agencies. Fibonacci Web Studio is a group which focuses on research and higher education websites and apps. And at that agency, I'm director of projects, which means not only am I the lead PM and I'm the content strategy expert, but I'm also part of our sales and marketing efforts and a frequent dabbler in code and design. Um, I try to leave it to the professionals, but sometimes I can't resist. Um, and that's a very small team. We're a team of about five. Um, Rooted is a little bit bigger. I'm a project management manager at Rooted as well, and they're a full service agency dedicated to nonprofits. And at Rooted, I focus solely on project management. So part of the reason that I go into such detail about my background is that I feel like while every small agency feels really different, and I know with working with two of them, they definitely feel different in the day to day, there are strategies that can be adapted to all of these environments and perhaps even to larger agencies as well. Um, while these two companies are different, a lot of the skills and tools that I use can be adopted for both. So a former colleague used to talk about managing content editors specifically as herding cats. Um, for those of you who might not be familiar with this idiom, basically imagine trying to make a whole bunch of cats move in a single direction. It's hard and it's frustrating and ultimately cats really don't care what I have to say and they have a mind of their own. So while I don't think that the whole of project management is like herding cats, I do think the skill set to successfully managing a project is kind of similar to that of animal training at a circus. So you have all these diverse and talented teammates, but your job is to manage them so that your team can make a cohesive whole. So I have like three animal analogs that I'm gonna use throughout this presentation. And those three most common animals in small agency web development are lone wolves. So I have found that most web developers who choose to go to a small agency as opposed to a larger agency or a really established company are tend to be lone wolves. They like building maybe in small packs, but often alone, and giving them a clear goal can be the best way to manage them. And I'm sure all the developers in the room can tell me if I'm wrong during the question and answer portion. Um, cats are basically your clients. They have a lot of competing priorities and getting them to focus on their web project can be kind of like herding cats. The other animal analog that I use for small agency web development is your mama bears. So in small agencies, you often have one or two team members 
who are tempted to take on everything about a project. They want to do everything from beginning to end. They're super strong and super capable, but they have difficulty delegating pieces to other members of the team. Obviously, this is mostly a silly analogy, um, and no one person fits into each category perfectly. But like an animal trainer, your job as project manager, especially at a small agency, is getting to know each member of your team so that you, in your role, can support them individually and help the team put on, to continue the metaphor, a great show. I promise that we're going to start to get more practical, but as an English literature graduate, I can't resist a good or bad circus metaphor to break, begin my presentation. So my number one tip for working in a small agency is to be agile, lowercase a, even if you are not agile, capital A. So trying to adopt a full methodol agile methodology while you're working in a team of two or three can really elicit a lot of groans, especially from developers who've been burned by, before by a project manager trying and unsuccessfully implementing agile. Trust me, I've heard these groans um, in trying to implement agile on some teams. Um, developers at small agencies often want to maintain the reason that they've moved to small agencies to begin with, which often include fluidity, individual ownership, flexibility, and a little bit of room to play. So they often value being agile with a lowercase a over being agile with a capital A. You can definitely try to implement like full scrum agile methodology at a small agency, and if you do, please be sure to blog about it so that I can read it. Um, but I found that it works better to adopt some practices from a lot of different PM philosophies and keep to keep changing really along with you and your agency. What's going to work today is not going to work tomorrow. What works with five people on the team is not going to work when you have seven people on the team. So daily stand-ups can be great, but what if you have part-time freelancers who don't work with your team every day? Perhaps bi-weekly stand-ups are a better solution. Um, what if a project only involves one member of a very small team? So we take on some smaller clients that we only have one developer working on those projects. A daily stand-up's not really gonna work the same way for that project because not everyone is as aware of what's going on. So we try to schedule occasional team brainstorming sessions as opposed to like an official stand-up. Weekly sprints might not work if you have a project that takes less than a week. We do have some clients that have some quick turnaround projects, and so you know, doing weekly sprints are not the best way to get those projects done. And I found that oftentimes on a small team, you don't have enough people to have both a product owner and a scrum master as sort of two separate individuals. So oftentimes those responsibilities can be combined across various members of the team. So one thing that I do consider a sacred from the Agile methodology, but you might not, every team is different, is the project debrief or postmortem. Um, every project brings with it lessons, and especially in a small agency, one project will probably not make or break your whole team, but not learning from that project and kind of taking the same mistakes into the next project, it's really easy to kill a small agency with three or four projects. Um, so making sure that after every project you're able to learn from it and recover before your next one is really important. So ultimately trying to adopt wholesale a single methodology is really difficult in a small agency because each team is comprised of different people and different methods will help them use their skills the best. So your job as a project manager at a small agency is not only to manage individual projects, but to especially manage the agency's process. And so ideally, each project is managed in a way that is more suited to the context each time. And again, if you're a small agency that's growing a little bit, even going from five people to seven people can make a big difference in what sort of methodologies are gonna work for you. Going from a team of two developers to a team of four developers is a really big difference. Um, so you have to make sure that, you, again, you're being agile, lowercase a as the word, even if you're not adopting a full agile methodology. So the next thing I want to talk about is meetings. So meetings for two to three people can feel like the Wild West. Everything goes, let's just rush in, guns blazing. Um, and while I hate to break it to all the Spaghetti Western fans in the room, this is a mistake. Um, it's certainly tempting because in a small team you all know each other's rhythms, you feel like you can read each other's minds, you've been working together for a while, and you might as well just hit the ground running. But 
This is a surefire way to get all turned around on your horse. So running meetings for small teams. I want to do just kind of a, hopefully a quick and dirty meetings 101 for small teams. Like with Agile, there's no need on a small team for formality for formality's sake. Again, you do all know each other. It's You don't want to implement things that people aren't going to enjoy or find productive. There are a few cardinal rules when meeting running, running meetings for small groups that will save you a lot of time and headaches in the long run. Number one is have an agenda. Don't assume that you'll all remember everything you need to talk about because you won't. I find a quick bullet pointed list is usually enough. It's great to share in advance, but having it up on a screen share or a whiteboard during the meeting works well too. If everyone knows what the map ahead looks like, then you're less likely to lose the trail. Number two is to time box. This obviously goes hand in hand with having an agenda, but once you know what you wanna cover, make sure that you can actually cover it all in the allotted time. No one likes an hour meeting that turns into an hour and a half, and it's much better to have two 45 minute meetings than one hour and a half meeting. Um, give an estimate for how long it will take to cover each item, and then be sure to keep your eye on the clock and kind of give people a little bit of a nudge when they start to hit their time zone. The next tip is to take things offline. So if you've ever worked in a corporate office, you might roll your eyes a little bit at, can we take this discussion offline? Um, and while certainly it's a bit, little bit of a cliche, um, it can be a really helpful tool. So the idea of taking things offline is basically the difference between a reply all and a reply on an email thread. So let's do a little scenario where you're in a meeting with a designer, a PM, and two developers. You're all on the same project, you're all talking about the implementation of that design. Um, a good conversation to offline in this meeting is when your two developers start having a very highly technical discussion about an API. I personally, as someone who's managing the budget for this project, do not want to pay the designer for you all to have a 45 minute conversation about an API. The designer doesn't need to be aware of all of those details. So this is a great time to do some offlining. Um, now, I don't recommend actually saying, let's offline this because people kind of have that visceral reaction, especially if they've worked in the corporate world before. So, hey, developer X and Y, it seems like this is a great thing to have a conversation in more depth about. Um, y, can you put it on your to-do list to follow up with X about this later? Um, everyone's gonna appreciate that you're respecting their time, and X and Y still get to have that conversation that's really important to them. The designer's gonna really respect that they don't have to sit in on this conversation that they don't fully understand, and when you're looking at the budget later, you will thank yourself. The next tip is not to ignore the niceties. Um, this is especially important for remote workers, but all small teams can benefit from a little bit of small talk. It's really tempting when you know each other super well to just sort of dive into the problem straight away. Um, but give yourself some breathing room at the beginning and the end of the meeting to catch up on your weekends, compare March Madness brackets, and brag and commiserate about non-work exploits. Again, if you're doing the time boxing agenda method, you can just build in three to five minutes at the beginning, three to five minutes at the end to make sure that you can all sort of connect on a more human level. Fostering team morale is always important, and it's easy to ignore company culture when you're working with a small group, but a little bit of bonding during every meeting can go a long way. The next tip is that everyone should walk out of the meeting with a to-do list. Every decision needs to be documented and acted upon. There are a couple different ways to do this. So each person can document their to-do list individually and share out at the end of the meeting and ideally at the beginning of the next meeting. Alternatively, you as PM can take ownership of taking notes on all action items and sending out a group email after the check-in. My personal favorite method is to use a project management software directly in the meeting. So on my teams we use Asana and I'll have that up during the meeting. And as we go through all of the different issues, we create and update the tasks in our system. So I as PM kind of take ownership of that, although people add their notes as we go. Um, we assign each one to a, a team member during the meeting and we assign a due date again during the meeting. This means we're not adding any extra steps to our workflow, so you don't have to send out the follow-up email, you don't have to make sure that you're including five minutes at the end for everyone to share out their to-do list. It's very clear what's going on. 
and you're maintaining your up-to-date project tracker. So you're not only taking an extra step out of your day, but you're also making sure that you don't have to go back to that project tracker and follow up with everyone's to-do items. And additionally, everyone can see what decisions are made. I don't have to email you to ask you for your to-do list to see what you're doing. It's right there in Asana for me. Um, additionally, if someone on the team is not in the meeting, you can still assign tasks to them. If it becomes clear during a development meeting that there's a design task that needs to be done, you can still assign that. And I, ideally, you leave a helpful note saying, if you have more questions on this design task, reach out to this developer with details or for more questions. So what if you only have one developer on your team? So we're talking small teams, but what if you're like a really small team? So surprise, all of these things are still true if you only have one developer. It is still important to have regular one-on-one -on -one meetings between the PM and a sole developer on the project. It is still important to come in with an agenda and leave with a to-do list. It is still important to be respectful of that single developer's time by time boxing and ensuring that follow-up meetings are scheduled if specific items require more in-depth detail. So unlike when you're offlining with multiple people because you're concerned about one person, you know, getting distracted and not being invested in that conversation, um, in this case, offlining things is so that you can have a dedicated meeting about that issue and make sure that you still get all the items on your agenda done. Um, sp additionally, even if you have one developer, still spend some time sort of doing that casual chat, that small talk, um, so that you can keep your lone wolf happy and well prepared for the work ahead. Next tip I have is to love and live by your project management software. So project management software is critical to keeping projects moving on schedule and on budget. Again, I think very highly of Asana. It's what we use on our team, but there are so many tools out there that trying to list them all would take me the rest of this session. Some of them are more geared towards enterprise solutions, and some of them are more geared towards small teams, and then there's a giant gamut in the middle of those two things. Um, so I like to think of PM software as the project manager's version of the text editor in that everyone has their preference, there are a lot of options, and trying to convince someone who uses Basecamp to love Asana is better done over beers than in this session. So find me later if you want to have an argument about it. <laughs> um, but whatever software you love, all of them are built around project tasks and deliverables to keep you on task. Um, it is critical to use them intentionally and thoughtfully to ensure your project's success. I don't know if you've ever started on a new team or come back after a vacation and you see that your project management software is just a mess of like overdue items that no one's looked at in three months and there's a bunch of stuff in there that no one really understands when it got entered and why. Um, we want to avoid that. Um, and in order to do that, you have to be really intentional about how you're using the tracker. So no matter what tool you use, I have some tips to help you try to get the most out of it. So one is that you need to be aware that notifications are very customizable. So this is both a good and a bad thing. So maybe on a development task, I wanna know every single thing that happens. I'm managing that developer very closely. But maybe on a design task, I only care if someone mentions me. I only wanna know when the design task is finished. I don't need to be involved in the ins and outs. So I can make that work for me. I can set up those notifications on a task by task basis. But if I have a mama bear tendency coworker, they can get notified anytime anyone does anything. So even if the task has nothing to do with them, they can still get a notification so they know everything that's going on at all times. So that's great. Um, it's great that it's so customizable for individual wants and needs, but because everyone can set their individual notification preferences, you can't be entirely sure that people are seeing what's happening um, unless you are intentional about it. So you need to get to know your team's flow you need to know who's using Asana or your project management. And I will use Asana as my default word, but you can feel free to translate that in your own head. Um, so you need to know who's using Asana in what way. You need to know if someone's checking it every morning, if they're checking it every evening, if they're only checking it when they get emails and what those notification structures are like. You also need to follow up on a Asana task in person or on your next phone call, especially if you have someone that isn't fully invested in that project management structure. 
Um, I also like to use Asana during meetings so that it's very clear what my expectations are in terms of Asana. So I like to make sure that it's pulled up on everyone's screens, that everyone can see what I'm seeing, that we know where the details of each task are living. Um, basically, I want to teach my team to use Asana as the central source of truth on a project. So if anything comes in to me via email from a colleague or from a client, I make sure to update the Asana instance right away. Email is not the source of truth. Asana is the most up-to-date version of all information. So two, if you don't have someone monitoring and cleaning up your instance often, it can quickly become an overload of information. I've seen everything from people creating duplicate tasks for the same issue to trying to build an entire admin interface and a single task in Asana. Um, so setting norms and enforcing them is critical to using the software effectively, and so is regular cleaning. You need to set aside time to review your team's entire instance and clean up things as needed. Again, this is where the like three month overdue tasks come into play where you can actually have a meeting with your team and say, okay, so this is some cleanup task that we set up three months ago. Is this actually a priority for us? How can we make it actually happen as opposed to just pushing back that deadline for three months? Um, you can and should include relevant files and links in your Asana system and sync to your Dropbox and Google Drive. You want to ensure that everyone has access to everything so that they can actually do their jobs and that they, once they see something in Asana that they can kind of run with it. You can also integrate your project management tool with your time tracking tool. I recommend if you're already using a time tracker and you're looking into a new software for project management or vice versa that you see what tools can integrate well together. Um, this is super, super helpful with a small team because I know a lot of people um, look at Slack or email and forget to bill that time to the client. Um, so if you're communicating with your team about a specific task in your project management system, you can make sure that that time gets tracked so that everyone gets compensated appropriately and all the time gets tracked and billed. quick time check, which is that I'm running quickly out of time, um, but I want to talk communication. So communicate often and well. So my number one thing to say about this is that communication is a skill and project managers, it is your job to teach that to your team. Um, so it can feel often like a miscommunication is the fault of whoever is miscommunicating, but I do feel like as a project manager, it's part of your job to make sure that your team knows how and when to communicate, what the norms are, and, and the ways that you should be doing it. So on the technology side, be sure to share new features as you find them. So if there's something specific about Slack that people need to know, about the do not disturb function, whatever your team members don't really seem to be internalizing about your tools, um, share that with them. Have a little meeting and show them whatever Gmail tool is coming across your way or a plugin that's really great. Um, additionally, ask new team members to lead specific portions of meetings and give feedback where it's appropriate, um, especially for client-facing communications. It's great to have developers and designers communicating directly with clients, but you need to make sure that the norms are set for that. It is helpful to at least once a month add a new layer to everyone's communication competencies. If you're a small team, making sure that you're bringing everyone along with you is really the only way to keep getting better and better as a team. So err on the side of being more clear than you think you need to. I used to say err on the side of over communicating, but I don't think it's just about volume. Um, it's really about focusing on the quality and clarity of your communication to ensure that everyone is on the same page. And lastly, re regularly check in to ensure that the communication strategies you're employing are working well. So if you notice that someone is never responding to Slack, ask them if they caught the discussion of the share bug on Tuesday. Just like make sure that they know what's going on. Um, make sure that your team is hacking Asana. See if they're in too many meetings and they just don't have time to do their work or if they're in not enough meetings and they feel like they're just like flying out there in the open and no one's checking in on them ever. Um, communicate about your communication. Um, 
An often overlooked aspect of project management is a positive and productive team culture. And of course, I have about five minutes left, so I'm almost gonna overlook it in this talk, but I'm gonna try to get there. Um, so for small agencies, team culture can basically equal company culture. Um, while you're not the sole source as project manager of team culture, you do play an important role in ensuring that company culture is maintained throughout the project life cycle. So allow flexibility, but make sure that your team members understand the limits of the flexibility. Have clear guidelines on how communication needs to be processed. So, you know, in our contracts, it says if a client reaches out to you, you have 48 hours to respond. Now that's a pretty long period of time. So our team norms are much faster than that, but you have to be clear with your team about what the norms are around communication. If I, as project manager, reach out to you as a developer, you need to know when I expect you to respond. Do I expect you to respond in five minutes? Do I expect you to respond in 10 hours? That's a really important thing to know. Um, ensure you have, again, some avenues for non-shop talk. Um, so whether it's a happy hour, a dedicated Slack channel, a weekly meme challenge, a quarterly dinner, just Make sure that you have some time built in to have a little bit of fun with your coworkers. This is especially, again, important if you're working on a remote team. Um, so that dedicated Slack channel where everyone can share their personal joys and accomplishments can be great. And also just sharing memes that are relevant or irrelevant to your work. Um, give kudos. So most platforms now have the ability to thumbs up messages, react with emojis, or at the very least, send the clapping gift from Citizen Kane. Um, make sure that your team members know how good of a job they're doing when they're doing well. Encourage and set boundaries. You as a PM should not be on Slack every night until 11. You're teaching your team members that they need to be on Slack until 11. Teach and then encourage folks to use the do not disturb and other methods to disable notifications during non-working hours. Talk about your office setups. Um, maybe share co-working fees if you're all working remotely. Um, and set yourselves up for success by setting your boundaries. At least quarterly, have individual check-ins with all members of your team. If you're working in a small agency, this is very easy to accomplish. Um, working in a small team requires that you be attentive to your team dynamics, and team members might have issues that you can solve or suggestions for how to improve communication, collaboration, or company culture. You won't know if you don't ask. So, whoop. while small agencies can feel like a circus, they are our circus. They're fun and they're agile, again, lowercase a, and they're a great way to meet clients' needs without a huge overhead cost. Being a project manager at a small agency often requires wearing a lot of hats, but luckily, like the Mad Hatter, project managers are known for looking very good in hats. This circus means everything to us. I hope that your small agency circus continues to be success successful. All right, so we have a contribution day slide up there. Contribution day is tomorrow. You don't have to learn no code to give back. Um, so great. And then I have a feedback slide. I can get there. It's too old too. There we go. <laughs> Made.camp slash 202 for feedback. And we have just two minutes left, so I don't know if we have any questions, but you can find me after. <laughs> what, so in your definition, and I think you might have said this before, what's a small team? I think mean, it depends. Mm -hmm. You know, if you've worked in a big agency before where you have like 200 people, 50 people can be like a small team. So it's relative. It, I definitely think it's relative. I do think that once you get over 20, there starts to be sort of more processes that need to be more formalized. But once you're, when you're under 20, you can really be agile and quick on your feet. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>